I would like to dedicate this talk to the following people who I have worked with in conservation in Wellington over the last 25 years. Firstly, Colin Ryder and Andrew Cutler. I first met Colin and Andrew in the Wellington branch of Forest and Bird, and both of them have made a huge contribution to conservation in the region and nationally. Stephen Fuller. Stephen was the first general manager of Karori Sanctuary, and he worked tirelessly to build the foundations of that successful enterprise. Michael Morris. Michael was the first chairman of the Karori Sanctuary Trust and put his reputation on the line for a crazy idea. And Evelyn Lynch. Eve has been with me every step of the way over the last 25 years and has shared all the ups and downs of the journey with me. A special thanks to you all. Okay, thank you very much for coming along tonight. It's uh, not, not the greatest evening. And uh, it's always a, a pleasure to talk about Wellington and, and where Wellington comes from. This is going to be a, a sort of a long range talk from, from where Wellington came from, Wellington's biodiversity came from, and where it, where it might be heading to. So there's quite a bit involved in this. Um, this is really a tribute to all of those women and men who over the last 25 years have given their heart and soul to make Wellington what it is now. And believe me, there are a lot of them. So some of those culprits will be named tonight, as many as I can, as I can recall. And uh, it's, it's a very special journey. It's been a special journey for a lot of people. And uh, it's been a privilege to be part of it, and a privilege to be part of that group. Uh, How about over here? Is that better? Okay. Um, so we're talking about the Wellington region in general, but specifically about the city areas, these areas here. Um, but we will get, talk about quite a bit about the whole region because there are a lot of special features about the Wellington region. Uh, Wellington doesn't really rate a lot when it comes to the best of this or the best of that. But I can tell you by the time I've finished, you'll be surprised at how much Wellington has that is uh, quite unique. Uh, Wellington region now, the whole region is about 830 hectares. Uh, it's got 400, 500 kilometres of coastline. It's actually the only one of the regional council areas which has a significant west, south and east uh, boundary on all the way around. Northland has the same sort of configuration. It has a, a full north, uh, east, west, north, east, west, east boundary. Uh, Waikato has a bit of a west, east boundary, and that's about it. Southland has little, almost qualifies. But this is by far the only one which has, and it's the only one with a, of that shape which has a, a really a, an axial range in it. So geologically, it's quite unusual. It's got about 25% of native cover left, uh, which is about slightly above average for the North Island. It's not uh, anything like some of the West Coast or Nelson areas down the South Island, but it well, well, ahead of, well ahead of a lot of the East Coast areas. We're going to go all the way back 20,000 years ago to Ice Age Wellington. So Ice Age Wellington, we're down here. If you'd stood on Wright's Hill uh, 20,000 years ago and had a look out to the West, you would have seen land all the way to the Taranaki Bight. And uh, Cook Strait, you might have seen Cook Strait. Cook Strait was a big embayment that came right into this land. So the sea level then was about 130 metres less than it is today, quite a lot lower. All around here would have been glaciations, glaci glaciated areas around here, not, not huge compared to the South Island, which had huge glaciations. Um, but all of this dotty stuff you see, you see here is what, what's called lowest, lowest windblown dust. So as you looked out over, over that area, you would have seen huge dust clouds all over the place. And these would have rolled on, rolled on week after week, month after month, uh, accumulating large deposits of soil, which uh, now shows up quite clearly. We've actually got this lowest soil above us on the, on the ridges above the sanctuary. It's quite, quite clear. And uh, they, they, all that dust would have come off fell fields like this. Kia would have been flying around over it. And, 
and there would have been a few some ice fields, nowhere near as big as the South Island. The South Island was largely ice fields at that time. This is roughly what you looked at. You would have seen tussock lands with uh, scruffy low scrublands, a lot of mataguri, a lot of spear grass, a lot of um, prosmas, and a lot of mulimbekia. Uh, one of the threatened plants of the south coast here is mulimbekia estonii. That would have been quite common in this landscape. And uh, a lot of tussock land, very dry, very dry indeed. Uh, very few swamps or, or, or running rivers. Uh, it would have had moa and been, they would have been hunted by, by a half eagle and, and other birds which would have been common at that time would have been things like takahi, snipe, those types of things which would have thrived in that. Going back a little bit, we'll go back to that map. The nearest podocarp forest would have been down here in Farewell Spit, a little refuge. So the, the forest birds would have been doing it really tough and up here in Auckland would have been the last of the the, the other area of refuge for the for the podocarp forest. All of around here would be scruffy beach forest. Wellington Peninsula doesn't have any beach. Well, we're part of a, a beach-free area, as we'll see shortly. Excuse me while I flick through this. So, fast forward to about a thousand years ago, and this is what the Wellington ecosystems would have looked like. Uh, we'll go into the oceans and coasts shortly, but. Uh, we had, we've got a number of rivers and lakes which we'll look at. We've a lot of extensive wetland areas which we'll go into. Uh, the forests would have been would have been a land of trim, all of covered in forest. The entire area would have been covered in forest. Um, wet forest on the west coast and drier forest on the east coast. It was steadily starting to dry out at that stage, um, and some shrublands on the on the on the axial ranges. So New Zealand is located in the Southern Ocean and we are right on the edge of a thing called the subtropical convergence. And that means that in the south we're getting cold water coming up from the Antarctic and warmer water coming down from Australia. And Wellington is right at the crux of that. This is where the convergence actually meets uh, probably more than anywhere else. So we get warm water coming down from the East Australian Current this sweeps around here, there's a Derville current comes up here, the East Auckland current, West Auckland current comes down here, and these eddies come down the, come down the east coast, and they bring warm water with them from the north. Up from the south comes the Southland current, bringing all the cold from the Antarctica, and it all meets here. Oops, what happened there? There we go. And the dominating feature, as you probably have noticed, is that <laughs> we get a lot of west winds, <laughs> The Tasman drift, and we also have a lot of northeast trade winds. So those are the dominant features of our of our locality. Now Cook Strait is a really interesting area. It's um, remember that uh, that area between here and and Taranaki, which was uh, above ground, above sea level during the ice age. That's all very shallow. All of this area up here, all the way to Taranaki, is shallow. No more than about a hundred meters deep. So it's, a, it's very shallow and it's actually warm because of those currents. As you come closer into Cook Strait, it gets deeper and deeper. And you come down here into the Cook Strait Canyon, uh, the Island Bay Canyon, the Nicholson Canyon, and then it drops off into the Hikarangi Trench. So from here you've got 120 metres, through here you get down, drop down to 3,000 metres. And that's one of the fastest drops anywhere in the country in such a narrow area. And Cook Strait itself is subject, because of its narrowness, it's subject to tremendous tidal changes. You know, the, the tide between here and there uh, is quite different and you get massive change, tremendous runs of, uh, of seawater coming through there. So it's a highly charged, high energy ocean system. And it's very rocky around here, a lot of rocky areas, but so it's extremely good for a whole range of fish. So we have uh, a lot of habitats and the, the, the high energy system means it's high, highly oxygenated. It means a lot of nutrients are being pushed up from the, some of these deep areas. So it's a very rich and, uh, and interesting marine environment. So Cook Strait, uh, that's Cook Strait. And of course we've got our wild coast. Um, who doesn't like the south coast? I mean the south coast is great, isn't it? <laughs> a few years ago I took some young Americans uh, around the south coast, around Ophira Bay. 
They were gobsmacked. They said, goodness me, this is amazing. They said, this looks like Guatemala. <laughs> and they really were quite charmed with it. And, and yet New Zealand, as if you said Wellington South Coast, they would sort of look at you and think, what the heck are you talking about? But in actual fact, it's a very dynamic and dramatic coast um, because of that high energy system. But we also have long ocean beaches all the way up from Paikokariki all the way through to Taranaki. You have this very long, wide open beach system and that's actually quite unusual. The only place that has uh, that you could probably claim to have a better ocean beach uh, system is the west coast of Northland which of course has unparalleled um, uh, long beaches. Uh, but once you get past Taranaki into the black beaches which are much hotter and uh, aren't as good as this. So these beach systems along here are very good indeed. Uh, we have islands, not a lot of islands. We, we're but um, low on islands. Uh, Kapiti Island is, of course, our premier one, which we're going to later on in even more detail. Uh, we have Mana and uh, Ward Island and and uh, Som and Soames Matthew Island, uh, but that's about it. So we, we're we're a bit low on islands, but we're nothing like the Hauraki Gulf or the Marlborough Sounds or Fiordland or those sort of places. But we do have some very interesting islands, and Kapiti Island is New Zealand's premier um, one of New Zealand's premier nature reserves. Uh, we also have estuaries, so this is the Waikanae estuary. Uh, not great estuaries, Our, we have a hut estuary, we have the, the estuary from Lake Ferry, around from, the, from, La, from Lake Wairapa, and we have the, further north we have um, the Manawatu estuary, um, and Waikanae and, and Otaki. They don't tend to be as rich as some of the northern ones like Miranda, or, those, uh, or Farewell Spit where they have tremendous uh, amounts of bird life, but they're still very good indeed. Um, our ocean and coast fauna, the distinctive thing around Wellington apparently was the harpooka. When the settlers came to Wellington, they, they found harpooka in huge numbers and the very big fish indeed. They can, a giant harpooka can be up to 25, 20, 20 kilograms in size, so they're very big. Uh, they, were fished out f those, those, they, they were fished out fairly quickly because, of course, harpooka don't, they grow very, very slowly. They, 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 they take a long time to reach maturity, so they, they don't suffer um, fishing pressure very well. Um, the other unique thing along here, of course, was Tohiroa, you know, those, those ocean beaches around Waikanae and up through Otaki uh, were a tremendous Tohiroa resource. And Tohiroa beaches in, in New Zealand are not that common. Uh, on the west coast of Northland, they are, are the premier ones, of course. They were introduced into the Bay of Plenty and they were found naturally also in Southland. But we were one of the three or four places that had naturally occurring tauroa. This uh, fish here is called Jack Mackerel, uh, the Taranaki Bite area, and from Cook Strait uh, up northwards is the premier Jack Mackerel fishery. And uh, other terrific fisheries here around, uh, around the Wellington area, the Ling fishery and the Hokie fishery, which are very, very productive uh, and commercial fisheries. But the really interesting thing about the Cook Strait area is the convergence. You remember that, that convergence we talked about, the warm waters and the cold waters? We are the convergence between the premier commercial fish in New Zealand, which is snapper and blue cod. So this is the, really the only place in New Zealand where they overlap in commercial quantities. Uh, blue cod are found in Northland, but they're very small and scrawny uh, because they're a cold water fish. And uh, they're nothing like the ones you find in Stewart Island. Uh, and the snapper really don't go past Nelson. Uh, the, the snapper, Nelson and Kaikoura is probably the southern limit for snapper. So the snapper 2 fishery, which comes down through into the uh, west coast of, of uh, southern west, so around Cook Strait, and also comes right down the east coast. This is the southern limit of it. So uh, we were a tremendous spot for marine mammals. Now this is uh, the area around here was the main pathway for migration for right whales, humpback whales, uh, all of those whales. They, they were, all these whales pretty much breed in the Auckland Islands area. Um, that's where the major populations are, blue whales. And they would move north on their migration pathways to Tonga where the, they would calve and then migrate back down. So we never had great permanent populations of whales around here, but when they were migrating through, they would have been a spectacular sight. And all the way through the channels between Kapiti Island and, uh, uh, and Waikanae and Paraparam area was, would have been something to see actually, and Wellington Harbour too. 
Uh, we also have all the other marine mammals, which we still have actually, at orca. There's an orca pods that float around the Cook Strait area, quite often seen. We have three types of dolphin around here, um, four types actually. We have the Hector's dolphin, there's the Hector's dolphin in the uh, population which run around the southern Wairarapa coast. Um, so it's a really interesting marine mammal area. And on top of that, we've got fur seals. And we, uh, there's historical records too of hook a sea lion um, uh, rookeries as far north as here too until they were hunted out. Um, marine mammals, uh, we had those seabirds. So uh, the Cook Strait area is a tremendous area for, 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 for seabirds, uh, particularly ones which uh, are like so shearwaters, shearwaters and petrels, uh, prions. Um, some of the Cook Strait Islands have populations of seabirds that are bigger than the imagination. I believe there's five million fairy prions on, on Stevens Island. So <laughs> uh, a few years ago, the, after a large storm uh, on Waikanae Golf Course, broad-billed prions were littered all over the place. There were hundreds of dead birds everywhere. And uh, it looked like a terrible catastrophe when you realise that there's about several million of them <laughs> out in Cook Strait. <laughs> You realise it's probably in population terms it wasn't that serious an issue. These seabirds would have uh, nested on the mainland in the old days. There, there, there's still a, 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 a Suri Shearwater colony out at um, uh, Pipanui Point, just out, out of Makra. Um, they probably would have nested around these hills, although those, these hills are a bit bony, so uh, they might not have been great around here, but there would have been seabird colonies around the Wellington coast and maybe as far back in as the ranges, we're not absolutely sure about that. But a great seabird place. Oops, killed it again. Um, shorebirds, not quite so brilliant here. There is a terrific uh, amount of shorebird activity up in the Rangitiki River mouth and the Manawatu River mouths, uh, which are a Ramsar site. And Lake Wairapa has very good short shorebird. This is godwits and knots and wimbrels and those types of things. Also has very good populations, but as far as uh, things like places like Miranda or um, the far north Pairingaringa Harbour or Farewell Spit goes, we're pretty small bickies really. We don't seem to have the estuaries which have the amount of small um, crabs and, and bits and pieces that uh, the northern ones have, but still pretty good. We're up there. And uh, penguins, we have a terrific population of little spotted penguins, we still have those. And we would have had yellow-eyed penguin up here. There was historical uh, and archaeological evidence of, of a variety of little yellow-eyed penguin that came this far north. So Old Wellington's Forest, uh, these are dominated by the axial ranges. You can see the ranges going through there, the Tararuas and the Orongorongas, which uh, run right through there. So on the west, of course, it's all wet, and on, on, the, on the east it's dry. And the defining feature on the east also is the amount of runoff that comes out here and collected in this enormous basin. So have a look at that. Uh, on, the, on the west coast, it's much sharper run, uh, much quicker to get to the sea. The peninsula area, very much uh, uh, its own little outlier. So the Wellington Peninsula would have, would have had this coastal forest mixture. So all along our Wellington coastline, you'd have seen this type of um, uh, picture. Nikau down to the down to the down to the cliff edges, and Koe Koe forest quite dominant all the way around it, and you can still see that up at Waikanae. There is still some quite a lot of it up left up at Waikanae. Uh, well, not a lot, but there is some left. But the place which probably mirrors it most would be Northwest Nelson. If you go around the Kumara area around there, you'll see that it, that's that's what it used to look like. Uh, inland on the peninsula would have been this Potocarp forest. Wet podocarp forest. So all of this green stuff here would have been this wet podocarp forest, and would have been dominated by rimu, uh, rata, um, miro, matai, those types of things. This is what it looks like. And there's there's quite a bit of it left now, but uh, it it took quite a hammering. And on the east coast. Over here is probably one of Wellington, one of New Zealand's now and most rare ecosystems. And this is the dry podocarp forest that would have been Totra, mainly Totra and Matai, uh, with, a, with some Kaikatea in it. But, uh, but it was drying out. Even well before Māori arrived, that forest was starting to dry out for climatic, uh, because of climatic change. 
and it was becoming very sensitive to fire. So there may well have been some burning going on even before Maori arrived in that area, and it accelerated quite a bit. There was a lot of uh, a lot of this area was lost to forest fires well before um, uh, during Maori occupation and before European occupation. But the defining feature of the Tarua Ranges, of course, is beech forest. In the north here, we had silver beech dominant, and down the south here is red and hard beech intermixed with potter carp. So this is a very interesting forest ecosystem around here, and there's some terrific examples still left. You know, the Wainuiamata catchment, um, the, Bilm, the, the area straight behind uh, Lower Hut and, and Silver Stream, those sort of places. Some of those regional parks there still are very, very good representations of what they used to be. And swamp forest, this whole, all this brown stuff you see here would have been dense Kaikatea, Pukatea forest and all the Waikanae flats all the way up here. Now these are now New Zealand's rarest ecosystems, only about 2% of it left. And uh, your remnants that you look for there is around Lake Papatonga and Namanu Reserve. Those are the sort of places you go to to find this. It's, uh, it's been well and truly knocked around. And that was a result of this massive floodplain here. Forest fauna. Um, the whole Wellington area would have had the normal range of stuff that you would have got from uh, in any other forest in New Zealand. But there's a few specialties that we'll go into. One is the huia. Huia would, were, were really the bird. bird, bird were, were south of the Ruahine range was the, the, the homeland of the huia. And... Uh, they were in significant numbers all the way down through here, and until re relatively recent times, um, there was a, a significant hunting went on with Fahui uh, around about the turn of the century when the, the Prince of Wales came to New Zealand was presented with a Hui feather, and it created a, a rage for for Hui feathers, and that that proved to be the demise of them. They tried to put some at a Kapiti Island, uh, that didn't didn't succeed. Uh, the Official website for Birds Online says that the last recorded sighting was in December 1907 in the Tararua Ranges, but my experts tell me that there were equally valid sightings at Gollins Valley in about 1909, 1914. There was a pretty reliable sighting at Macra uh, about 1920, and uh, Captain Sanderson, who was the founder of the Forest and Bird, actually recorded uh, discussion he had with a, a fellow at Pai Kokariki in 1920 where he swears and declares it was a very reliable huia sighting. So they were hanging on around here quite quite late in the piece and uh, very distinctive bird. Kākāpō, we would have had Kākāpō all through here uh, but they were declining fast even when uh, European settlements started. Uh, there was Quite a lot of speculation as to whether there was a population in the Tararua, even, even up into the 1950s when the Tararuas was included in the, in the wildlife service surveys for, for, um, for remnant populations of Kākāpō. Uh, they found none, but Paul Jensen, uh, who ran the Kākāpō recovery pro program, did tell me that he found that there was a reliable sighting uh, in, the, in the 50s that he felt uh, was worthy of at least taking some notice of. Kiwi. Um, kiwi are a real case around Wellington. <laughs> the Kiwi anomaly. <laughs> uh, when, Euro when European settlement started in Wellington, there were no Kiwi here. And uh, there's a bit of a puzzle as to why. Uh, there was one little spotted Kiwi found on Mount Hector in 1870 and another one across in the Wairapa about 1884. Um, and that's about it. Apart from that, there have been no kiwis recorded in the Wellington region. And uh, later on, it was later identified when they investigated fossil remnants from middens and, things, and, and other archaeological um, um, digs that they discovered that the kiwi that we had here was actually the rowie, which is the Okarito brown kiwi. And for some reason, it died out during Maori occupation. Now the Rowie, the Rowie's range retracted all across its range. It was all, always quite. It was common not only in the southern North Island. It was also common in Marlborough Sounds and down the west coast. It was quite quite an ex extensive populations of them, uh, and they soon retracted to just this tiny population, Okarito. So there must have been something about the Rowie, 
which meant it wasn't as robust as the North Island Brown Kiwi or the Tokoweka or the others. And uh, somewhere along the line, they, they, they lost out. Uh, they did tend to cohabit with little spotted kiwi. So there's some discussion as to whether the interaction meant that both populations were, were vulnerable because they, they occupied the same range. So we just don't know. But uh, it could well be that we, there was a, a proposal in our restoration strategy that we bring Rowie back in here. And uh, we could still do that. So, uh, Kaka. Uh, Kaka, of course, is now a distinctive bird of Wellington, <laughs> whether they like it or not. <laughs> but uh, Kaka would have been what you had heard and seen the most in a Wellington forest in the, in, in the old days. Would have been huge flocks of them. In fact, uh, Mount Kaukaua here is named after the Kaka. And uh, there were stories of how the Maori hunters used to bring um, barrow loads into them, into the markets at Tiaro to, uh, in the early days of Wellington settlement. So it's great to have them back in. <laughs> they would have been very distinctive. Bellbirds are an interesting case. Uh, bellbirds, we haven't been able to establish them here, so they're, they always enter my mind as a, something we need to actually think about. Uh, when I was a lad growing up in Northland, there were no bellbirds. And uh, in fact, bellbirds are very scarce north of about Hamilton. Um, and nobody really quite knows why. They were, they were there, and my, my, my dad used to say that they disappeared around about 1910 with the wicker. And it was thought that they were sub, they, they managed to, they, they caught some avian disease. Um, there's records uh, showing that they did have a major population collapse around about the 18. 19th, uh, early, early 20th century, and uh, disease is thought to be a contributor, although there's no evidence for that at all. Uh, but they did recover around here, and they're, they're quite a, the, the south is quite a stronghold of bellbirds now. There's the bellbird populations all around the area. So bellbird is a distinctive uh, a thing which you get here, which you don't get up north. There are no bellbirds in Auckland. Tuatara. Uh, when Tuatara disappeared off the mainland, uh, Cook Strait became the stronghold of the Tuatara. And, um, uh, and we'll, you, we, you won't need any more explanation about that. They were a very distinctive uh, element of the, of the fauna of the Cook Strait area. Wet Wellington. Uh, the rivers in Wellington are really interesting. We, we don't really have the big um, uh, shingle rivers, the, the, the braided rivers that they have in the South Island, which is a very distinctive river system. Ours are mainly fast run, fast flow river systems. And the big one, of course, is the Rua Mahanga, which comes off the Tararuas and it catches several other big ones like the Wahini and the Taranika. And then there's a whole lot of little ones off here. The Hutt River, which drains the central uh, um, Ruahinis. The Arong and there's others like the Arongaronga and the Waikanae and the Otaki. The Otaki, this is the Otaki River, it's uh, about 59 kilometres in length um, and quite a tremendous river system actually and relatively intact. The Ruamahanga is the daddy, daddy or mummy of them all, it's about 250 kilometres and uh, has tremendous flow. Generally our, our, our rivers would have had the massive whitebait runs, just typical of, and grayling, those uh, grayling would have been a feature of these rivers too. Our lakes, Wellington's lakes are incredibly interesting. We don't have a lot of lakes, uh, but the lake we do have, the big one, is Lake Wairarapa, and a Lake Horafanua is further up, which is a bit out of our district, but we'll include it in the conversation anyway. This is an old painting of Lake Wairarapa. This is a painting of, of Lake Horafanua, which was regarded by some of the early settlers as one of the prettiest lakes you could see anywhere. I don't know where they got these mountains from. <laughs> Painter's license, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, but they are shallow basin lakes. They are not uh, most of the lake. Most, biggest lakes in New Zealand are either glaciation lakes, like White Lake Wakatupu and Lake Tiana, are created by glaciers, or they're volcanoes, like Taupo and Rotorua. And uh, so, Lake Wairarapa is by far the biggest shallow basin lake of the lot, just caused by depression in the in the in the, in the land. And they're pretty uncommon. There's not a heck of a lot of them around, actually. Um, they're quite rare. So New Zealand is so hilly and so um, uh, you know, so bumpy, you might say, that uh, that they're, they're not that common. So uh, 
as, as, a, as a pair, though, incredibly interesting. Lake Wairarapa is, was huge in its heyday. The, the, the active floodplain area, which was the area that would be underwater in, on a normal flood, was up to 220 square kilometres. That's down to about 78 now because of various drainage works. But there was a huge, huge lake. And, uh, and this whole wetland complex that run up here would have been something special, would have been absolutely amazing. The whole wetland complex around here is about 2,500 hectares. Most of that's been drained for um, dairy land now. It's now the economic powerhouse of the South Wairapa as opposed to the wetlands of the South Wairapa. <laughs> uh, lake Horofanua has been recently described as the lake of shame. It's in such a mess. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible example of how not to look after a lake and uh, whether they're ever going to be able to recover anything like that, well, who knows? There is a plan to do it. But there is a major, and we'll talk about that later, there's a major effort to, to, to fix up Lake Wairapa. Uh, a very distinctive feature of the Wellington area along here was dune lakes and uh, Lake Papatonga. This is Lake Papatonga. So dune lakes form, as you, you probably know, they form in depressions between sand dunes and they, they're created by a seal of peat. And uh, and they, they're really impounded. They don't have a lot of inlet and outlet, so it's really, um, they, the drainage is quite, uh, they get very acidic. Um, but we have a whole string of them. Uh, I once took an aeroplane aer flight up this coast, a low, a low aeroplane flight, and I was amazed at how many little dune lakes there were still. In, it's like lines and lines of them. And the, uh, the, the only place really which has natural dune lakes like that now in New Zealand is Haast down in the South Island. So if you go down to a place called Ship Creek and have a fossic around there, you'll see some of the remnant dune lakes which still exist. Um, wetlands, we would have had massive wetlands all the way around this, this coast up here, all the way up to Whanganui, and this area around here, just vast wetlands. They, were, they would have been very special, and uh, they would have looked something like this. You would have had tall Kaikatea forest right down at the edges, and you would have had... Uh, um, the normal margin of, uh, of rapu and flax and typical as, as fern birds would have been typical of the fauna in, that, in those wetlands. They would have been covered with waterfowl. I won't go into the decline too much because this story is about getting things back on track. <laughs> uh, but uh, fire and land clearance of course made a heck of a mess of this. Uh, burning, the burning started uh, after Maori, Maori occupation Something like about 30% of New Zealand, mainly on the east coast, was burnt before European settlement. And um, in the Wairapa, for instance, uh, was quite, a lot of it was actually shrublands and grasslands when the first people drove sheep across there. That's what attracted them to it. And in the South Island, there's all that waving tussock land is not natural. That's, uh, that, would have, that would have been dry totra, hawes totra, and, uh, and beech forest. Um, about a thousand years ago, and a lot of that was burnt off. Uh, it would have been an ecological disaster of, of amazing proportions and uh, created tremendous erosion off the southern Alps all the way across the Canterbury Plains. So a lot of that happened uh, a long time ago. And those, uh, th those are what are now called induced tuc tussock lands. They're not natural tussock lands or not original tussock lands. Logging, uh, as soon as the settlers arrived, they got into logging in a big way. Uh, there was something like about six sawmills in the Karori Valley here, that, uh, right from the word go. They, they wouldn't have been the industrial scale sawmills that you saw today though, see today. They would have been these sort of things, a pit sawing uh, with, with half a dozen men breaking their backs, chopping up these logs. <laughs> would have been a heck of a job. <laughs> but they still made inroad into it. And uh, if they needed to clear it quickly, they burnt it of course. Um, one of the Last, uh, the logging was still going on in the Akataras in the 50s. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, the Moore brothers in Wainui Mata uh, had finished logging Moore Valley, so they were the sawmillers in the, in the, in the Wainui Mata area. So they decided then that they would start on the Wainui, Wainui Mata Valley next door to it, and they just started the chainsaws up, and the, not the chainsaws, the, the tractors up, and the water board came along and said, we're shutting this down, buzz off. And uh, because of that, we may now still have the Wainui Mata catchment, which everybody, how many people have been here at the Wainui Mata catchment? That's the finest piece of unlogged rata remove forest in the southern North Island. 
And uh, so that's the sort of thing which, uh, that, that was a, a tremendous uh, stroke of luck to save that one. Beautiful piece of forest. Um, we got the normal run of invasive pests. Um, I'll talk about goats a bit though because goats never used to be on this Wellington Peninsula area. They were never on the south coast. And then I think in the 1980s, uh, a group of farmers out there decided that the scruffy land out there would be ideal for goats. And there was a bit of a, um, a resistance to it because a lot of people didn't want goats out on the south coast. Um, Bob Moody, who used to walk around in a caftan, he was one of those, the police association um, chair, I think he was, or, or director. And uh, they said, oh no, we'll never let our goats go, they'll be too valuable. Well, the, now the south coast is black with goats. So uh, that's a, a terrible shame. But one thing which did, we did not get on the south coast is deer. We've never really had deer here. And, uh, and that showed up in our, and all pigs, there are no, not a huge population of pigs here compared to the, what's further back in the ranges. So when we did come to clear the valley, um, the, the valley actually hadn't really been browsed anywhere near as much as a lot of the places in the further into the ranges had been. Uh, here's where the good news starts. Um, the awakening starts with the nature reserves. And in 18, around the 1890s, there was a lot of concern about the decline in bird life, the rapid decline in bird life that was going on. So the government was petitioned to start some nature reserves and they started three. One was Resolution <laughs> Island, one was uh, Little Barry Island, Hauturu, and the other was Kapiti Island. So they were purchased and, um, and put into, into uh, reserve status. They were the first nature reserves, I think, in the world. I, I can't quite confirm that 100%, but uh, they were the first time that anybody had ever said, we need to have a place where nature is preserved for its own sake. Uh, up until that, the national parks had started a little earlier than that. The national parks had started about 1870, but they were largely preserved for scenery and also for outdoor recreation, e.g. bear hunting. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody was concerned about preserving the bears in Yellowstone, I can tell you. <laughs> so they were a remarkable uh, New Zealand innovation, and it started here in Wellington. Uh, and in 1917, a fellow called Captain Sanderson, Val Sanderson, came back from the war, and uh, he got really into the, he had a visit to Kapiti Island, and was disgusted by the amount of goats and, uh, and feral animals that were running around the place. It was a mess. So he formed the Royal Forest and Bird Protection Society of New Zealand, uh, which was formed in Wellington. Wellington. Yeah, how about that? And uh, uh, mountain clubs. Mountain clubs also became instrumental in the whole movement. They were the very ones who started advocating for national parks on a, on a serious scale. And the Tararua Mountain Club was one of the most strong of the, of the lot. The uh, Tararua Mountain Club was a leader in, in, in this whole thing. And uh, there was a movement in the, in the 1930s and 40s to have the Tararuas uh, made into a national park as a centennial project. And it almost got to the line, but in the end, the Minister of some resources or other decided that it was much better to keep it just in case they wanted to use the water for it hydroelectricity and uh, keep the, and they needed the timber for, for milling and it fell over. So it stayed as a forest park and it's still a forest park. A forest park is quite different to a mountain park. But the mountain clubs were instrumental in that whole movement. And Wellington also was the seat of the science and NGOs. So Wellington was where all of the uh, DSIR, these sort of people, the soil scientists, and, they, and this is Sir Charles Fleming. Uh, and most of the uh, NGOs like the Ornithological Society, the Botanical Society, and Forest and Bird, they all had their head offices here. So Wellington was quite a hotbed of, of environmental activism from the world, from, right from the word go. However, by 1990, um, we confidently call Wellington a biological cot case. This is the, what the vegetation profile of the, of the place looked like at that point in time. Much diminished. The ocean and coast were in a terrible state. I don't know if anybody can remember when you used to go up to Moa Point, all of the raw sewage just being poured into the ocean. Uh, Wellington Harbour was as dirty and filthy a place as you could come across. Um, all of the coast around here was being trashed. There was quarries, Quarry at Ophira Bay. Um, it wasn't good. 
And even before that, during the 80s, if you'd gone out along uh, Paikokariki and Paraparam Beach at night, you would have seen huge banks of lights out on the horizon as the squid fisheries strip mined the, the, the coast around New Zealand. And uh, right up until the 1980s, that was cowboy territory. There was nobody giving a, a toss about it. And it was only in the early 1980s that uh, the Ministry of Agri Agriculture and Fisheries was uh, given the brief to sort out the whole fisheries thing. And, uh, and they brought in some world-class legislation to, uh, to sort that out. But the oceans were just going backwards fast. Um, greatly reduced forest and poor condition. Nobody was doing any predator control or pest control around the, the entire region and possums were building up to astronomical numbers. Wetlands, they were being degraded and cleared out at, at a terrific rate. Um, they were regarded as a fair game in those days. Bird life was severely depleted, uh, right down, I think, uh, going back to Paul's quote before, it was down to, at one stage, I felt, I think we got down to about two pairs of pigeons in Otari, and then somebody said, they moved out when the magpies moved in. So. <laughs> And Raywin Empson was the one who said when the OSNZ survey uh, looked for tui breeding pairs in Wellington, they, the number they, best number they could come up with was, was half a dozen, and they were in the in the valley here. Um, so they were down and down to that little that number. Um, and bellbirds had dropped out of the system here at about 1958. Whiteheads same same time. So it was just a, a gradual elimination of species. Very little expenditure on conservation management, almost none actually, uh, apart from DOC. DOC uh, was formed in 1987 with a what was what would now be regarded as a ridiculously healthy budget. It's been severely de uh, chopped out ever since. Poor protection of remnants. Uh, developers would just move in on a block of bush and just knock it over. There was no protection under the Resource Management Act for it. It was a uh, fair game. And Wellington City was in particularly poor shape. So where did all this start? Well, when we got into this, it started with the national NGOs. It seemed to start there. This is Forest and Bird, Botsock and OSNZ. They were the activists around town here. And uh, every Forest and Bird branch had their little project. Uh, hut, Lower Hut had Soames Island, Machu Island, uh, Kapiti Island. They were working hard on Kapiti Island. Our local branch was working on, on, on those sort of areas. OS and Z were doing their bird counts religiously and advocating wherever they could. Otsok were the most active. They were tremendous people. They'd be all over the place, counting plants everywhere. And people like Chris Horn and Barbara Metcalf. Chris is here today, isn't he? They were instrumental in that whole thing. And Chris, I'm sure you could name a long list of Botsok people who I could never be able to name who worked hard in, in those early days. And that they, they sponsored planting programs like Tapaturamranga Marae, and uh, Wright Hill Reserve and Trillisic Park, they all had their little community groups. Um, a lot of them based on Otari as well. Local planting and care groups, they, they were these, they're the ones I'm talking about. They, they were often 30 or 40 people, sometimes more, who'd get, get this energy going. They'd get out there on the bony hillsides of Wellington <laughs> and they would plant plants. And in, if, you, if you were there at the time in Wellington in 1990, you would know that the hills around Wellington blazed yellow uh, at a certain time of year when the gorse flowered. <laughs> and every time, every time we had uh, the fifth, the, 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 the Guy Fawkes Day, I would, I would be absolutely petrified because you'd know there would be fires all around Wellington. And uh, the, or around about 8 o'clock at night, the sirens would start wailing and the fire brigade would come out. And right across the Hutt Valley, there'd be enormous fires and they'd just go on. And we had a fire bug here in Crory, which burnt half of the hills of Crory for years. It was just terrible. So these planting groups, they, they, they boxed along in terrible conditions and they, they just deserve a huge pat on the back. Um, my friend, Greg, Gladys Rainbow McGrath was the one who was instrumental behind the uh, Wrights Hill Reserve just above us. Gladys, I don't, is she still with us? Not sure. Hmm. Um, so it was a powerful and growing community action movement and, and that's what we walked into. We walked into something which was starting to grow. 
And uh, around about that time too, the island eradication started. This is Breaksy Island at the head of Breaksy Sound. And even I had the privilege of spending a week on this island in 1993, I think it was, with a land care group where we went out at night counting uh, knobbly weevils and flax weevils, <laughs> sticking little bee tags on them and <laughs> tripping over the seals. It was terrific. But this is the first island, which was the major island, which is clear. There wasn't the first one. Down here is a little island called Waiheke Island, not the big one in Auckland. Oh, and uh, I think it's Waiheke, might be Wairaki. Uh, and that was the, the first, uh, that was Experiment Island. Land Care and Dock got together and they cleared that island. It's about 30 hectares, I think it is. It might even be less than that. And, uh, and they tried out this bait station method. They put out a, a bait station grid. 50 meters and tried it out and it worked. So then they moved off to Breaksea Island and did that with 187 hectares. So they grossed the whole thing up. And that changed the whole game completely because up till then we had no way of getting rid of rats and things off, off islands. And as soon as that happened, Wellington was right off its, <laughs> off Wellingtonians got right off their butts <laughs> and started doing it. So the first one to get cleared was Matthew Soames Island and well, a lower hut forest and bird had been lining this up as soon as they heard about Breaksea. They, um, Matthew Soames Island at that stage was the quarantine facility for Ministry of Agriculture and, F and Fisheries and it, they were about to close it down and uh, lower hut forest and bird had sort of put their dibs on it long before that. It's, it's now a joint management thing with, um, between DOC and, uh, and Te Awa. Uh, tense Trust, uh, not Tense Trust, might be Waifatu actually. Anyway, the Te Ariawa. But at that stage they, they lobbied hard for it to become a reserve, which it has become, and they got rid of the rats. So it was one of the very first islands after, after break sea to be cleared of, of rats. Manor Island was done in 1990. Manor Island, funnily enough, never had rats, and nobody can figure out why, because it was a whaling station and a, and a commercial base during um, early settler times. The place must have, should have been crawling with rats, uh, but it was crawling with mice. And uh, anybody who'd been to Manor Island at that stage would have known there was a mice plague in biblical proportions. It was actually reported in, on a National Geographic. It was so immense. Somebody um, estimated the population to be in the billions. And literally, when you went out to the furry, the, the old wool shed at, at uh, Manor Island, rats were, uh, mice would be running up and down the whole thing and running over you and coming up your going up your clothing, it's just mind-boggling. Um, that took two years and was, and I think is still the only successful mouse eradication that there's been. So uh, it took two drops of storm poison, then they put a, a, a grid of 25 meter uh, bait stations out and they just kept on plugging away at it until they got the last mouse. Uh, Kapiti Island was cleared in 19, uh, first of all in possums, so, so the the job of getting rid of possums on Kapiti was no mean feat. And uh, our, our general manager, uh, first general manager, Stephen Fuller, was involved in this. Stephen, excuse me, along with uh, some other people, uh, uh, Kerry Brown was involved in that, Bob Keynes was another was involved in that. They hunted these uh, possums for years and finally got down to the last possum. And Stephen will tell you about the day that they caught the last possum in the, in the tree up, up on the high up on the ridge, and they treed it with these dogs, and then they shot the tree to pieces, and this tattered possum fell down to the ground, and they all cheered. <laughs> uh, but the the clearance of Kapiti Island of, of rodents was a landmark um, affair, and that was. Uh, managed by our own special Raywin Empson. Raywin is our conservation director. One of the reasons why Raywin uh, is now an honorary member. She was working for DOC at the time and that was a whole order of magnitude bigger than anything that had ever been done before. And if that had failed, it would have put the whole conservation uh, technology thing back 10 years. It was the first time that uh, helicopters had been used using a GPS system. And, uh, and it worked, and it worked because of Ra everybody put the obvious contributor, but Raywin's meth method, method, the way that she methodically went about a task, planned for a task, executed a task, was just outstanding. 
And of course, we saw that all the way through her record here at the sanctuary. So she was a special with that one. So uh, by by the time we got through that lot, we had no islands without with 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 any any nasties on them. So that was really good. Um, even I got involved in Forest and Bird in 1989 when we got hooked in at a, a um, Earth Day thing out at Percy's Reserve and Colin Ryder, uh, the branch vice president, uh, uh, grabbed me and found out that I did some planning. He said, we need a plan for our branch. And I said, oh, okay. So I got into, into the branch and uh, they made me boss of planning. And I said, what do we do in Wellington? And they said, we don't do anything in Wellington. We, we work on Manor Island and we work on on um, Kapiti Island and places like that. But I said, well, hang on, when, as I drive around the city, I see all these bits of bush, there's heaps of them. So we set up a plan to inventory those uh, bits of bush, and we came up with Natural Wellington. This is the Natural Wellington team. It's Chris Matheson, this is Maggie Vasiliev, Fiona Wilson, Thor Van Gorkum. There's a very handsome chap there, I don't know who that is. And a very charming Eve Lynch, and Jeff Sheeran, who Jeff was our mapping person, Bill was our bird map person, Maggie was our plant person, Fiona was our runner and worker, and Chris was our photographer. So we had a nice little team going there, and we, we pulled in everybody from around, everybody had expertise, anybody who knew anything about it. A guy called Tony Beecham uh, was involved at that stage. He was the one who uh, came up with the, with the notion of bird corridors, which we thought had to be incorporated into the whole, whole scheme of things. And... Uh, as far as I can see, it's, and I might be wrong here, it was the first genuine example of urban conservation planning in New Zealand. I can't, I can't think of any others. Um, and it did introduce that notion of corridors. How can we link all these areas together, these disparate little bits together, and make, uh, make a contiguous areas? Uh, and it also introduced the idea of conservation sites. And uh, there were 35 sites that were identified in that plan. It also uh, introduced the novel thing of pest and weed control. <laughs> Goodness me, once you have a site, you've got to do something with it. How about getting the pests and the weeds out of it? And the theme for it was to bring back the birds. It was a lot of fun, I have to say. We, we had a ball doing that. And, uh, and it, was a great, it was a great time, great experience. Here's the original Natural Wellington plan. And here's the original map. See how they... And most of these places now have come to pass because what happened was it became the Green Park co papa of the NGOs and, and the Wellington City Council. When, when I presented at the Wellington City Council, I think you were there, Andy, at the time, um, it was Jim Bellich was the mayor. No. And, uh, and it received quite, quite, it was well received, very well received. The whole notion of conservation sites went down a treat and that was incorporated in the first district plan, that conservation site. Pro WCC land purchases, this is where my friend Andy Foster came on the scene <laughs> and Andy I think was instrumental in filling in the gaps especially along this area around here isn't it Andy? Something like seven or eight purchases were made, key purchases were made under your auspices. Twice that, 16 and uh, helped fill in those gaps around the corridors and Spooky Gully that was all bought in Te Kohanga Reserve they call that now. Um, so the, the council really got on board with that in a big way. Um, management of reserves became something that, uh, that, that became uh, sort of almost part of the business of the city. And a guy called Ken Wright was uh, working for, for the Greater Wellington Regional Council. He was, uh, and his manager, Ray Cleary, they were the, they were the uh, pest control group under the Greater Wellington Regional Council. And Ken saw Natural Wellington and said, we need one of these for the region. And he went away and did the Key Native Ecosystems Program, which uh, identified 100 sites around the region that were of significant ecological value and that he felt needed funding and work on. And some of those were in Wellington here, actually. They did work around Otari and, and various other places. So straight away, it started having effect. Um, and during the, that one, of course, we identified Karori Reservoir, which stood out if you go back to that map, you'll, it, it's almost like the hub of a wheel. And as soon as it went up on a map, it became very obvious that the Koori Reservoir was a, a key element in the whole strategic context for the, the whole plan. 
and uh, and that set the context for the sanctuary. I, I believe that without natural Wellington, the sanctuary would never have happened. So uh, it's uh, it was the it was the essential forerunner to the to the sanctuary. And of course, uh, along came the proposal in 1992. Uh, I won't go into that in any great detail because you know that backwards. Um, but that the proposal came when the the when the um, there were, there were three real real catches to that. One was the whole notion of mainland islands. Alan Saunders and his threatened species unit team at DOC were developing a concept called mainland island at a place called Mapra up in the King Country where they were trying to save a population of Kokaka. And Alan came and talked to our branch and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a mainland island in Wellington? And then on a visit we had up north to a friend's place near Kaitaia a guy called Don McKenzie was experimenting with electric fences around a small bush block to keep rats out. And I thought, oh, electric fence. <laughs> we could fence somewhere in Wellington <laughs> and make a mainland island out of it. And the logical place was the Koori Reservoir, but it was, it was still an active water supply area at that point in time. And there's no way that uh, GWRC were going to entertain anything like that. So I didn't really bother about it. But then 1992, the Regional Council announced that they were going to decommission the top dam and that land was going to become available. And I think, Andy, you were on the group that I met up at Denton Park there. And uh, I proposed, said we should fence this area and turn it into a sanct wildlife sanctuary. And I think John Gilbert thought, thought I was some sort of nut complete idiot. <laughs> but it got, gained its momentum after that and the trust was formed in 1995. The fence was built in 1999. And it became a catalyst for wider action. The, the whole notion of the sanctuary, and still is, is that it's a nursery to repopulate the greater Wellington ecosystem through that whole, all those corridors. And of course, that's happening. Um, and it became the mothership for other local groups, uh, like our friends over in uh, Pole Hill Gully here now, who, who uh, are busily keeping the saddlebacks alive as they fly out of the sanctuary, doing a great job. And it inspired a national movement. So from the first fence sanctuary, uh, there was a, uh, a national movement set up where, where other, other areas decided they would have a, uh, a, a fence, uh, well, like fence sanctuary. I think it's about 10 or 15 of them now. It's quite a, quite a substantial amount called Sanctuaries of New Zealand. It's a nationwide movement. Um, it didn't quite work out as I'd hoped for because when we started this one, I talked with Kevin Smith at Forest and Bird and said that this should be a forest and bird initiative and we should set one up in every major city as, a, as an attraction for people to get involved in conservation. Auckland should have a couple, you know, Christchurch, Dunedin, uh, every provincial city of, of size. And he sort of poured freezing cold water on the whole idea and just threw it out the window because I felt that forest and bird could have used its brand to raise 10 or 20 million dollars as a national trust and then they could have bankrolled sanctuaries in every town. Instead the sanctuary movement has gone off a bit half cocked. You know we have places, we have sanctuaries in very remote places and a lot of them aren't viable. Some of them are very viable though like um, the ones which impressed me the most is Arokanui in Dunedin. I think it's very well organized and, uh, and, and very well located. Um, and the Tafarinui one in Auckland is well set up. I'm going to go and visit that shortly. And uh, the one at, uh, at Hamilton, the, uh, the Mangachautari, I think is bitten off a little bit more than they can chew. I think it's a bit too big. Uh, the one in Brook Valley is, is, is a possibility. So they're coming along. They're doing the, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a movement that hasn't run its course yet. Um, going back to the oceans and coast, during uh, the 90s, when I, when I first joined the branch, Colin Ryder and, and a couple of others were working on the Island Bay Marine Reserve. They seemed to work on the Island Bay Marine Reserve for about 25 years. <laughs> Kapa Taranga Reserve, and they eventually got it. And also the Kapiti, Kapiti Marine Reserve also went through a tremendous fight. But we did get those marine reserves, and they were some of the earliest ones after the one in Lee and Auckland. Uh, they, were in, they were the forerunners. The South Coast and Harbour Restoration. Uh, Moa Point, of course, cleaned up a lot of stuff around the corner. The Wellington Harbour, uh, Wellington City Council assiduously worked away there with improving the stormwater distribution, spent hundreds of million dollars on that, and the harbour is nothing like it used to be, is it? Only it's much improved. 
and uh, spent money to close down the Fira Bay Quarry, which was making a heck of a mess of that whole area. So tremendous investment went into the coast around there and also the purchase of um, Te Kopaha Reserve as well. Um, the Little Blue, Blue Peng Penguin Program, that, uh, that gained pace all around the place. The, 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 this has been running for a little while now and has been very successful. Little Blue Penguin, Penguins were completely ignored for a while. They were still on their own for a while, but now they've been doing very well. Uh, the Marine Education Centre was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, Victor Angelini and his group had big ideas or big plans for the Marine Education Centre being the sanctuary equivalent for the, for the ocean. And, and it was a good idea too. It was a good, well, well set up and well thought through, but never quite got off the ground. Fell foul of resource consents. And uh, they were probably just a bit unlucky that uh, we, we were one of the first resource consents awarded in Wellington uh, when the Resource Consent Act started to bite and uh, I know Stephen Fuller has said to me several times that we were a bit lucky because he said he, don't, he didn't think we'd get a resource consent now if we applied for it now. And uh, that's what happened to the Marine Education Centre, they couldn't get a resource consent. So that's a shame. However, we still have a marine reserve and we do have a marine education centre, it's just not as on the same scale as it was before. Fish stocks, they're much better managed now, um, despite what uh, everybody gives, gives uh, Ministry of Fisheries a bit of a hiding. They are managing stocks far better than they were ever managed in the 1980s. Uh, things like snapper, for instance, is at about 40% of virgin stock, which is, in commercial terms, is actually very good. Um, it's unlikely we'd ever get back to th something like 100% of virgin stock. That just probably won't happen. It's just the same as we won't get back to 100% purity on the land. Uh, it's not going to happen. But 40% of virgin stock. When, when those um, uh, fisheries regulations came into being, some of our prime fish stocks have been fished down to less than 10% of virgin stock. So they are significantly better than they were before. UWRC's K&E program. How am I doing? Uh, has rolled on and, and has been significantly funded over the years. Something in the tune of one to two million dollars goes into that program every year. And uh, the Wyoming Nuremata catchment is the, sh is the shining light in their, in their um, crown because that has been turned into a mainland island. They now manage it intensively for as, as much for biodiversity purposes, for water supply purposes. Uh, we have a regional park network now which now a lot of them are now managed with a biodiversity overlay. May not be their prime purpose, but in the before 1990, they were either commercial or recreational or services. Biodiversity wasn't mentioned. Now virtually all of these are managed with a biodiversity purpose. This East Harbour Park is terrific. I don't know if you've ever gone into the back there behind, um, so behind Eastbourne. That's a terrific piece of this Wainuamata area. Um, all of the Kaitoki area is really good. So the regional council is, is making a lot of progress in that area. Possum control, um, Ken Wright and Ray Cleary grabbed the whole of the animal health board money as fast as their hands could get onto it. And they have since then uh, done a tremendous job in, 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 um, in, ten, in ten, with 1080 application across the whole region. And we have one of the, low, one of the best have had one of the best possum control programs anywhere. That's starting to drop off now, which is a little bit of a worry. Lakes Wairapa and Pencaro. So the, there's a very large, um, this is the Pencaro Lakes, Lake Ko, Ko, Kohanga Teri and Lake Kohanga Roa. Uh, two Pencaro Lakes up by the lighthouse. Have anybody been there? Yeah, lovely spot. Uh, those, those were purchased and those, they're under grazing regime for uh, a period of time, but eventually they will be returned to natural catchment. And Lake Wairarapa has a huge restoration or, or, or um, recovery program, uh, which involves the local iwi and uh, is making progress. Uh, district councils, it's a bit mixed as far as, but some of them are very good indeed. KCDC has a, a quite a reasonable green uh, aspect to it, although uh, some people will say that 
probably not. They could do better. But, but Porirua recently won uh, an award for cleaning up Titahi Bay and has uh, done a similar effort to, to Wellington. And many of these others are putting money in now where they just wouldn't have bothered before. Community groups, they proliferate all over the place. Uh, in, in the Wellington region, there's 150 registered community groups that are doing work on biodiversity, and about 50 of those are in Wellington City. So quite a significant number of people. Q2 covenants, so private conservation. Uh, Wellington is, is a, a not the biggest region. The Waikato and Northland and others are much larger. The Northland is about a million hectares, but on a ratio of area, we have one of the highest uh, QE2 covenant rates in, in New Zealand. Partly it's because we have some of the most threatened environments in New Zealand, <laughs> and we've lost a lot of stuff, but uh, the QE, Queen Elizabeth II Trust has been very active in this area and has had a high level of take up. And that adds something like about 3,000 hectares to the, to the conservation estate. So very good indeed. Private restoration is going on pace in a lot of areas. And people's gardens. Uh, I walked past the, the, this garden on the fourth tee at Waikanae Golf Course most weeks. <laughs> and uh, I looked over, there's a garden being built there in this new house, and I thought, hang on a minute, those are Mullenbeckia estonii. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know the story about Mullenbeckia estonii, but it was a very threatened plant. There was only about half a dozen plants left out on uh, the south coast, they were being fiercely grazed by goats. Colin Ryder and a few others and some of the Botanical Society and John Sawyer got together and they uh, organised a recovery program and we spent a lot of time out planting Molenbeke Estonia out at Tarakarai Head and out on the south coast and other places. Mike Orchard arranged to plant them all through Victoria University and he became the head gardener at Lower Hutt Council, so they became started turning up in traffic islands all around Lower Hutt, and then <laughs> and then blow me down. They start turning into a, a prime into a prime garden plant, <laughs> and that would never have happened twenty years ago. You you you, you might have found a koai and a putakawa and a, maybe a rimu if you're lucky, but now you find all sorts of native plants in, in nurseries all over the place. So Natural Wellington's a plan achieved. Um, the sanctuary we can put down as a success, I think. Uh, the forest area around Wellington is increasing all the time, and and those who you can't imagine what it was like, the difference between what it was like 25 years ago to what it is now, unless you've actually seen the two. All around Karori, for instance, the Karori is going to be in 20 years' time. Karori will be encircled by reasonably tall forest, and uh, and the city will be as well, and. Uh, it's just wonderful and 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 uh, terrific, and the improved bird life it's just gone up like like um, exponentially um, and a wave of community action and enthusiasm so we've got these community groups all around the city working hard um, and a city which is de dedicated to become predator free and it's just uh, really wonderful and we are a national leader there's no question about it we're a city transformed and a region transformed, and apart from the other councils, which council area areas which have been very active in this, have been um, have been um, environment Waikato, which have put a lot of effort into this sort of thing. But apart from that, um, Auckland for a while until Rodney Hyde got a hold of them and put a red line through biodiversity as a <laughs> as an objective. <laughs> I think Auckland has disagreed with that, and they brought it back as soon as he left. But uh, <laughs> But apart from that, there isn't anywhere around the country that could begin to, to put forward the record that Wellington has. That's what the map of the wilderness areas look like now. These are the, these are the protected areas, and it's growing all the time. We've got a predator for you. Well, fresh water is an issue which everybody needs to work on. That's not as good as we could, could be. Um, perhaps we could do with more marine reserves as well. And... Uh, private lands, so we are a leader in biodiversity. The biggest changes, I would say the biggest change I've seen is institutional change. In 1990, uh, the council had no notion that they should be involved in biodiversity, and neither did the regional council. Uh, that was Doc's job. In fact, they didn't even know what Doc's job was in those days, I think. <laughs> uh, 
uh, that's completely changed. It's now um, it's now embedded in the in these institutions as a way of life. And here's an example of it too. About mid 1990s, Maureen Burgess from Lower Hutt asked us to go out and help plant some trees along the motorway. Uh, she managed to talk NZTA into or whatever the equivalent was in those days to giving us some money to do that. So we went out there and I said to Maureen, Maureen, we're planting Australian weeds here. <laughs> this is all bottle brush and gum trees. <laughs> so we all just about downed tools and went home. We were mortified. Well, the Waikanae uh, Expressway, which just came into, into being recently, is the largest fallow ground restoration project that the country has ever seen. 150 hectares of native forest is being planted and 15 hectares of wetland is being, um, is being uh, built. And when the transmission gully goes through at the back, it'll be even bigger. 200 hectares of native forest will be planted. And what you'll have is the ultimate corridors, forest corridors following the, 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 the roads. Um, and collective action, what's happened over the last 25 years is a terrific private-public partnership. And the sanctuary is a good example of that. You know, we start as a community enterprise, we work with, with councils, and everybody has been working together. The council works in with these community groups. It's a, it's a tremendous partnership going on. And the dollar investment, that's the other big change, from nothing in 1990 to millions today. And you can't do anything without money. Uh, so believe me, it, it does work. So we just got to sustain that effort. Uh, in the future, I'll, I won't go into this too much because we're running over time, uh, but ob obviously Operation Halo is very important. Uh, larger management zones in the ranges, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, Blue Wellington, we need, we need a, a, probably a plan to work out the coasts and the oceans because we have some special oceans and coasts out there. So we've been forgetting about them a bit. We left, leave those. Integration of management and the economy would be a good thing. Home conservation, I'd like to see everybody turn their backyard into a little mini sanctuary, just like Lynch's property out at Waikanae where <laughs> we have bird life all over the place until a pair of falcons moved into the neighbourhood and chased them off. <laughs> and predator-free <laughs> and predator Wellington. Uh, it's wonderful to see the council committing, anti-council committing itself to uh, a, a forward program along those lines. It's really great. So uh, here's how the giant sanctuary might work. We might fence off a, this is the Rongorong, that's the Rongorong River there. We might fence off uh, a small area in there as a nursery zone, just like we've done here. We might bait station intensively an area around it of about 10,000 hectares. And then we would 1080 the rest of it with aerial poisoning. And I'm guarantee that that would transform the Orangorongas. So that's a project for the future. And that's not impossible to do. I've costed that out, funnily enough. <laughs> it would be about seven million for capital and about two million a year operating. That's not hugely expensive, is it? So uh, before I close up, what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, the two people who've received awards and recognition today. Andy uh, did a lot more than just um, engineer the purchase of those key blocks of land. He was on the first group, as I mentioned, up at Denton Park, who talked about that, and he's been a sanctuary slave ever since, haven't you, Andy? <laughs> he's one of the first volunteers, and he was on as a board member for six years. Um, might be nine, actually. Yeah. And after that, he, he became a guardian for three, six years. And he's been a volunteer, him and Anne have been volunteering for from day one, really. And he's been a feeder and a goodness knows what here, and a monitor and a, in anything up the valley. You can't get Andy out of the valley. So Andy, thank you for the tremendous amount of work you put into the sanctuary. It's been absolutely marvellous. Well done indeed. <laughs> And the other one here, who's not here tonight, but uh, I'll give the valedictory to her anyway, is Rowan Empson. Rowan, uh, when she did the uh, Kapiti Island rat eradication, Stephen Fuller and I said, there's only one person we would really like for conservation director for this place, somebody who can achieve the impossible, and that's Rowan Empson. So I had, we had no money in the bank at that point in time. 
So I had the job of going to a friend who happened to be a philanthropist and uh, came back with a cheque for $100,000, I think it was, for uh, two years to pay Raywin's salary. I still reckon that's the most important thing I've done for the sanctuary. <laughs> and, uh, and we were able to lure uh, Raywin away with that gift. We were able to lure Raywin away from Doc and uh, she has been just a credit to the organisation ever since. The number of firsts which she has beside, beside her name is just mind-boggling and uh, she has just been terrific over those over that entire period. And her, the, the, as I said before, the myth, methodical thinking through of a project, looking at all of the uh, risks, all of the possibilities, uh, but not letting those difficulties bog her down. As soon as she'd thought it through, she would go for it and you would guarantee that it would be executed with 100% professionalism. And if, if it didn't work, and very few of them didn't work, then you would have to say it was uh, factors which just could not be, uh, could not be, could not be overcome. So uh, Raywin, of course, won't leave us. She'll be here uh, forever. She's still living up the top there. And uh, so she's been tremendous indeed. So thank you very much. So...